Oh yeah, also welcome from my side. So as Taka already said, my name is Florian Stahl. I'm right here in Germany. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about the updated version of the OVA top 10 privacy risks uh, today. So I don't want to tell you too much about myself. Um, I have, I would say a rather classical career in information security privacy. I'm rather coming from the technical area, did penetration tests a while back and now I moved more and more to the security management um, area. Back in 2014, I founded this OWASP Top 10 Privacy Project together with a colleague. And um, yeah, I still lead it today. And uh, we thought it's time to, to update it because it's been a while. And that's what I'm going to tell you today about. So, well, what is a pri the privacy situation in the world at the moment. So I have a few few words put on this slide. And of course, privacy is about personal data. So data that is about you, about me, about individuals. Um, in, the, in the English speaking area, we rather talk about uh, personal identifiable information, which is not the same, but uh, similar. And then we are uh, facing several challenges at the moment. I mean, there is regulation out there like GDPR, like CCPA, and in other countries, there are similar regulations. Um, but this regulation maybe is not perfect yet. Uh, you've seen, uh, you maybe I might know Mark Schrems, the privacy activist from Austria, that uh, and uh, the European Court just decided that uh, the GDPR or the transfer mechanisms to third countries are not really appropriate. Also, one reason for that is because there are still secret services that violate uh, fundamental rights uh, by doing surveillance because they want to avoid uh, further terror attacks, even though it's maybe not sure if, they, if they're succeeding with this so surveillance. And then, of course, we have a global world. So uh, even though we have already regulation that is maybe valid, in more than one country, we still have different regulations all over the world, but we have one global internet. And of course, then we also need somehow global standards. And that's also what we're trying uh, to establish with this uh, over top 10 privacy risk project. Then there are internet technologies. And uh, I think most of you know that uh, surveillance is the business model of the internet and your data, if you're on Google, on Facebook and so on is, uh, is uh, yeah the things that they sell to advertising um, and um, that this is kind how these companies uh, earn their money. And at the same time, there um, what I experience in, in many different companies, there's still a lack of implementation of privacy in practice, uh, not only because people do not want uh, privacy or do not want to implement, also because there are still too less or too little people that know how to do it because I think it's not so difficult, uh, but uh, many uh, do not know how to implement it. Yeah, um, but it's not only about the companies, maybe also the authorities um, should uh, yeah, improve uh, still the enforcement of, of the regulation that is out there. I mean, we have still many co open court cases. We have situations like maybe at the moment that is not directly related to web application, but there are self-driving cars that record uh, the, their surroundings with a camera. This is also a really um, an issue for privacy. And there are always new technologies that have also to be considered uh, by the regulators. And in the end, we also have, of course, strong lobbyism because, um, yeah, these business models, if privacy will be enforced really hard, let's say, um, is, of course, uh, uh, threatened by uh, huge global companies, social networks, search engine providers, and they invest a lot of money to, to avoid that um, uh, regulation and also enforcement gets too strong. So this is the situation. And uh, now let's come to the OWAP Top 10 Privacy Risks Project, some, some facts and figures. Um, so as I mentioned, we started back in 2014. We founded uh, this project and we published version 1.0, also together with the University of Applied Sciences in Munich. And um, this was an early, kind of earlier time in privacy than now. Now privacy has matured. And then we also got contacted by the European Data Protection Supervisor that founded the Internet Privacy Engineering Network. We, we became part of that and that helped us to also distribute uh, this message. 
And of course, it's uh, not only about privacy risks, uh, because if you know your risks, um, it's good, but you still have to do something against your risks. And that's uh, what we what we are trying to help with the countermeasures that we published uh, in 2016. And then uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, we published version 2.0. Um, and I will tell you more about that later. Currently, we're working on the countermeasures of version 2.0. And the project is available in five languages. Soon it will be available in seven languages. And we have the OWASP lab project status. And of course, you find a lot of more information uh, on the project website as well. So what is the goal of the project? Um, we want to identify the 10 most important technical and organizational privacy risks for web applications. So it's not about only about technology, because technology can help to establish privacy. But in the beginning, you also might have to do some design, some business decisions. And so there is, uh, there are yeah, technical topics that help to improve privacy, but also organizational topic. And the top 10 pro, uh, project shows uh, both of them. And it was important for us also to provide transparency about privacy risks, independent from local laws, independent from that, what maybe huge companies think, because I think there are, many privacy risks that are not really considered a lot in, in practice yet. And uh, we also wanted to keep it, yeah, as I mentioned before, there's a global world, there's a global internet. We do not want uh, only consider one certain law, we want uh, to consider uh, it as a best practice for privacy in web applications, uh, let's say worldwide. And if you see these OECD principles here, um, those principles are also uh, part of many uh, regulations and laws. So this is nothing really new for those of you who have already uh, dealt with privacy before. Yeah, and of course, then uh, we also want to show countermeasures. We want to educate developers, business architects, but we also want to help legal, those people who are often responsible for privacy and data protection in companies that maybe do not have so much of an idea how to implement privacy in practice. We want to help them give some guidance, easily understandable guidance, how they can improve privacy in practice in web applications for real and not only on paper, let's say. What is, what is not in scope uh, in the project is self-protection for users because we think it's not in the responsibility of the user to install some tools on their browser, on their PC to protect their privacy better because this is, this is something that maybe we as security or privacy experts can do, but for the normal user, this is very hard. And in the end, to be honest, it's kind of nearly impossible to really uh, protect privacy. You might improve privacy by installing these tools, but it's very hard really to protect everything. And that's why we think it's in the responsibilities of the application providers to protect uh, our privacy. Yeah, a um, few words about the method that we used. So, of course, there was some kind of uh, scientific um, model behind it. We took the OECD privacy principles as a baseline, and then we identified um, 20 different potential violations in security world. You would probably call them threats, uh, but in privacy, it's, it's rather already violations. And um, these violations were then rated with a, let's say, classically risk rating uh, by combining the impact with the frequency of occurrence. And then we got this rated list of privacy risks and we took the top 10 as the OWASP top 10 privacy risks. Of course, there are uh, more than 10 risks. And on the website, there is also the list provided with the risk number 11 to 20. But I think it's already uh, most companies, um, I mean, they already take one or two steps forward if they take the top 10 uh, risks seriously. And I think it's also a, yeah, uh, maybe uh, uh, um, very important for the success of these over top 10 projects, not only the privacy risk project, but also the classical top 10, that it's kind of simple and it's not too much because it's, if it's too much, then it might overwhelm the, the developers or whoever has to implement it. And then in the end, of course, we also um, evolve countermeasures and best practices. So to um, evaluate the frequency of, of occurrence, um, of course, the idea at first was to take some statistical data, but we recognized that it's still very hard to get real statistical data about privacy violations because companies are not very keen on publishing them. 
And even though uh, even authorities do not have too much data about the, the root cause or the reasons why um, uh, data protection or privacy incidents have happened. So we decided like uh, back in 2014 to make a survey among experts and we uh, in the end 60 experts participated and rated how often these violations occur in websites. The impact rating uh, was done by an expert judgment and um, we took the application operator perspective with 30% of the impact uh, with impact on reputation and brand value and also financial loss and 60% the data subject perspective with um, impact on social standing, reputation, financial, financial well-being and also personal freedom. So now let's have a look at the uh, at the results um, of this um, of the updated list, and you can also see how things changed since 2014. And you can see um, the first uh, three risks did not change: um, the web application vulnerabilities, operator sided data leakage, insufficient data breach response. Uh, but the fourth risk is very new, and I will say a few words about this later on. It's consent on everything. Then we also have non-transparent policies, terms, and condition. Uh, still, but a little bit lower rated, the insufficient deletion of personal data. I think this is now also part of many regulation. My, maybe this is why the risk uh, decreased. Then another new risk is insufficient data quality. And then we have missing, missing or insufficient session expiration, uh, inability of users to access and modify data, and the collection of data that is not required for the user consent purpose. We also added here what you can see in the, in the right uh, column, um, if it's an organizational or a technical risk, because this was sometimes criticized uh, about the, the first version that we did not have uh, give a hint if this is, has to be directed to the developers or it's rather an architectural or business topic. So um, we um, added uh, this if it's a technical or an organizational risk. So now I will say a few words about uh, some of those risks, um, but we don't have the time to go uh, through uh, all of them in detail. But uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, more information on the website and you can also find this presentation uh, with some more details on the project website. So um, yeah, just because it's the number one and it's still the number one, I want to say a few words about web application vulnerabilities, which is basically uh, what the classical OWASP top 10 uh, project addresses. And it's, um, yeah, it's still a, also a very high risk to privacy because if you have vulnerabilities and if there's personal data processed in your web application, of course, this is a risk uh, that it can get hacked and you probably know what to do against it. You can perform penetration tests. You have to train your developers. You have to um, um, apply secure coding guidelines like from OWASP or some others. And of course, uh, patching is also uh, still very important. If your software is out of date, um, yeah, there might be vulnerabilities and personal data could be easily accessible from those who shouldn't get access to it. Well, um, a very interesting new topic and um, one that I personally also think um, is very important and that I like that it's quite high on this new list is the topic of consent on everything. And uh, it's, you probably, I mean, watch web application, social network, uh, search engine, you, uh, you use usually click one time on consent and then you accept that your data is used for profiling for everything. It's transferred to 100 other uh, sub companies or other companies. And as a normal user, you cannot really estimate if this is appropriate or not, or if you really want to be transferred to all of these company. Maybe you would rather prefer that it's only used for a certain purpose, for the use of social network, for uh, communicating with your, with your uh, friends, but you don't want that it's used for advertising purpose, but you can't really, you don't really have a choice. And this is something, um, I mean, the, the current regulation is, often based on consent, a lot on consent, but um, there is also a very good uh, talk on, on the post-consent um, um, privacy from Helen Nissenbaum. She's uh, not a technologist, but she's rather uh, somebody about, yeah, who, who um, um, 
yeah, talks about uh, social things and so on. And she says consent doesn't work and we need some, some other regulation like we have it maybe in for phone companies and phone companies are not allowed to listen to what people talk on the phone. And she says um, social networks, search engine providers should not either be able to uh, listen to the send, at least not to the sensitive data that we are looking there and that we are providing there. And there should be some more rules and, uh, and the content should also be uh, voluntarily and you should uh, or the regulator the states should um, restrict data flows and uh, because otherwise these companies get too powerful and they are have too much influence on our minds on the politics on everything and uh, yeah I think this is makes sense um, I think we are also still far away from having that really but um, yeah if you like it think about it share it uh, maybe discuss about this concept. I think it would be very helpful to improve privacy. Yeah, uh, one more uh, new topic is insufficient data quality. Might not be a privacy topic at first. Uh, you might rather think uh, confidentiality is important for privacy. But of course, if your data is not correct, think about your credit rating might not be uh, correct. The, your, your package might not be delivered to the correct address and so on. So data quality is also very important when it comes to privacy. So it's important that your data is up to date and correct, uh, that there are possibilities that you can update your personal data on in this web application. Um, but also that the provider or the web application uh, trend that if it, they transferred your personal data to third parties, and if you update your data, of course, you also have to uh, provide this updated uh, data to those third parties. Yeah, and then uh, the eighth risk, still one of my favorite risks, is the missing or insufficient session expiration, because this is something that is hardly discussed. This is not part of any regulation or laws, but still, um, I mean, one of the first lessons you learn as a security expert for web applications, you need an appropriate session timeout. I think we all know that. Um, Banking sites, of course, have it. But if you have a look at social networks, um, search engine providers, and so on, they don't have it. Um, or they have a well-hidden um, logout button. It's probably in the second level of the menu. And usually you don't log out. And what you see here on the right side are all the open sessions that I had with Facebook because I logged in from some location close to my hometown at some point. And of course, you can manually and kind of complicated log out from these sessions, but it doesn't happen automatically. And that means at the same time that these providers are able to collect data from this device about you all the time. And of course they do it on purpose because they want to have as much data about you as possible. And um, I think it would be helpful to have an automatic session timeout for these uh, applications as well, or maybe at least that you can configure it and, um, yeah, and activate it if you want to. Yeah, um, so, um, well, so much about uh, the most important risks um, that I wanted to present you. And as I mentioned, um, there is are some more details about the other risks uh, on the website provided as well. I just want to uh, spend a few minutes to talk about the challenges that we had in creating this version 2.0, because most of you usually only see the results. Uh, but of course, it's not as easy as some of you might think to get to these results at first. I think most of us are kind of busy. We have a job and usually in security and privacy, there's a lot to do. And uh, so, and OWASP is a, yeah, a foundation of volunteers, of course. And uh, it's, you don't always have so much time for this volunteer work as you would like to. So we already started with work uh, on version 2.0 in the beginning of 2020, actually. We wanted to be done half a year later, but uh, it turned out that, uh, yeah, it took uh, more than one year until we had this version 2.0. And um, of course, it's also, I mean, I really like this event, this 20th anniversary event. And uh, I, yeah, it's, it's a global event and uh, it somehow connects the security people. And this, this was also done in this project. We had people from the US, we had people from India, we had people from all over the world that uh, worked on this uh, on this project, um, core team about five or six people. Um, but of course, it's also challenging uh, already when you want to have a phone call or a conference call, you need uh, to find a time where everyone is awake, let's say. Uh, that's also why we worked a lot in Google Docs. So we commented in Google Docs and we uh, yeah, 
try to uh, improve solutions. We discussed also in Google Docs so that we had some, let's say, time independent uh, working uh, mode. And uh, of course, in the end, we have very different people working on the project, which is also, a, yeah, let's say, a, an advantage because everybody has a different mindset and brings in new ideas. But in the end, you also have to focus on the big picture. At, at some point, you have to bring these discussions to an end and find a, a, yeah, a, a consensus and uh, so that everyone agrees and so that you can publish in the end this uh, final version 2.0. I also had the feeling that it was harder to find volunteers than in 2014. Maybe it's because privacy experts uh, are busier uh, at the moment. And what something that was also challenging, you might have recognized that um, some of the risks maybe are a little bit similar. And of course, there are overlaps between the topics and it's also not easy to um, decide, okay, which topics can you merge and which topics can you separate? and also which abstraction level you take. Because if you get uh, take very detailed risks, you probably would have a risk list or a violation list in the beginning of 50, but this would just be too much. And uh, nobody will probably uh, participate in a survey if it takes two or three hours because you have to uh, assess so many different topics and it would just not be uh, possible to handle this anymore. So this was also um, not that easy. Yeah, um, well, what are the next steps? Um, I already mentioned we still are working on some translations. We are working on the countermeasures for version 2.0. Of course, everybody is welcome to join the project. Um, we have a mailing list uh, on the project website. And maybe even more important, uh, spreading the word, uh, bring it to your friends, to your colleagues, to your companies, and apply it in practice because privacy only improves if we really implement these things and we do something against the risks. Uh, I know that it's not always easy, uh, but still, I think, um, yeah, it's a little bit what we can uh, do to make the world a little bit more safe, secure, privacy friendly. And yeah, that's uh, what, I, what I'm also working on. And uh, so, um, yeah. Thank you very much um, for your, uh, also for your patience in the beginning, because we had some technical issues. Thank you very much for your attention. And as uh, um, Takaharu mentioned in the beginning, I will be available on Slack for at least uh, 30 minutes to answer uh, your questions. Thank you.